Hi, welcome to FISMA Fridays, and uh, delighted that we are going to be recording FISMA Fridays this month in August. Unfortunately, we had to postpone our live session um, on Friday due to unforeseen circumstances. However, in the spirit of everything going on with FISMA, we thought it was important to get this information out to you, given some of the updates going on. So we are recording this session, sending a link out so everyone can stay up to date, and we will focus a little bit also today, along with updates, on um, sort of key components, ready for FISMA and what you should do if you are not. My name is Jill Bender, VP of Marketing with Safety Chain Software. Always delighted to host these sessions. Um, today, I have um, Payman Fatimi on the phone with me today. Thank you, Payman, for agreeing to record this session on a Saturday. Much appreciated. Thank you, Jill. Good to be with you again. Delighted to be back and uh, I'm having this uh, chat with you. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and again, um, in September, we'll go back to our live session. But again, lots of lots of good updates and information to share. So let's go ahead and just dive on in. Share. What is the latest? I know we've got some good stuff to share today. Uh, we sure do, Joe. It's been a busy week with the FDA and some of the regulatory updates, as many may know. Uh, we finally got uh, got to see some of the, at least, the guidance documents that the FDA I promise, and everybody's been anxiously waiting to see and what they look like for the FISMAR compliance and the preventive controls for human and animal foods. And so we finally got to see portions of that, at least. It's a pretty comprehensive uh, document. The, it's a 14-chapter document, five, first five of which were released this week that, that have a lot to do with it's, you know, components of the food safety plan, uh, conducting a hazard analysis, uh, implementation of preventive controls, what preventive controls uh, can be applied, how to, how to conduct them. And uh, so those are kind of essentially the first five uh, chapters uh, for the, for the um, preventive control guidance that have been, uh, have been um, submitted. And there is a rest of them are going to be being um, presented eventually within the next year or so, I think by 2018, uh, entire uh, guidance document is going to be uh, submitted to the, for, for public to review and, and comment on. And there are some specific components to it, uh, like some extension dates on some of the final rules that we're going to talk about as well as um, some clarification on uh, to what extent the rule applies to whom. So well, with that, okay. we'll, uh, we'll kind of jump into, I, I guess, to okay. some of the questions I've been submitted. No, absolutely. That's great. So five of the 14, and I'm going to take a guess that the, each chapter is not necessarily two pages long. They're pretty in-depth no. um, chapters. Absolutely that, not. Yeah, okay. they are. They are. Uh, we have. We haven't had a chance to fully digest them, but each one mm -hmm. is is pretty comprehensive. Uh, upwards of anywhere between 10 to 40 to 50 pages long at this wow. point. And I think for those that have taken the PCQI training so far to become uh, PCQIs for their companies or other organizations, we'll see that a lot of that what was taught during that PCQI training is summarized here with a little bit more depth. So I think FDA did a nice job of harmonizing and aligning those, you know, the curriculum that is being taught right now within this guidance. And, and are those documents readily available on the FDA site? It is. It is available on the FDA website, and we've also uploaded them to our TAG website as well for those interested, so you can, you can get them either way. And, yep, um, a great reminder there because I know um, you, you do post quite a bit on your tag site in regards right. to FISMA. So that's probably an easier place to find them, I would imagine, than um, combing through the FDA site. Great. Well, yeah, maybe uh, a little bit easier to navigate through, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, no Cliff Notes versions, though, from TAG, right? So this no, is probably, no, uh, so, uh, <laughs> not yet. We will, that's certainly going to be the topic of and subject of future FISMA Friday discussions, but at this point, we're just kind of 
putting what's been made available in them will also certainly go back and, and digest it more in more detail so that it's a little bit easier. A little more palatable to, to uh, talk about it. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's uh, go ahead and uh, sort of dive into some of the questions that um, that were sort of pre-submitted around um, what to do if you're not ready for FISMO compliance. But I think a lot of it is, you know, reference to the new enforcement dates announced. Um, and, uh, you know, we're discussing this, but let's talk about what, what's changed and, and what hasn't changed. Great question. And I think is probably the single most anticipated part of this guidance that people were you know, interested in asking about. And I think just talk about what hasn't changed is, is a risk-based approach that the FDA has taken in putting together the harp seed plan, the food safety plan. None of that has changed in terms of how the companies should go about identifying the risk within their supply chain, within their process, and uh, determining whether that risk has a hazard that rises to the level that requires a preventive control and implementing the preventive controls, the monitoring record documentation, the recall plan, and any other component that currently resides within the rule. So none of that has changed. What, this, what has changed are some of the dates that components of the rule are uh, or need to be implemented. For instance, this applies to preventive controls rules for human and animals. Some of the provisions in the food safety, uh, produce safety rule, as well as foreign supply verification program. Uh, just to give you a kind of overview of what we've seen so far, uh, as far as the preventive controls rules for human and animals, uh, certain written customer assurances. So if you are a producer and you are relying for your downstream supply chain for your customer to uh, manage the risk to implement the preventive control, then compliance date for that has been pushed back to September 19, 2018. So a couple of years out. And it does require the manufacturer process to disclose in documents accompanying the food that this food has not been processed and uh, will require further processing. So that disclosure needs to, needs to accompany the food and to ensure that the customer will then be responsible for manufacturing and uh, rendering the product safe. So Got it. complying to that component is, uh, is pushed back. Um, for facilities that are currently covered under preventive controls for human animals, uh, but pack or hold dry agricultural commodities, aligning with the compliance date. And that also actually includes some of the haulers, shellers, and those who pack and hold nuts and, and tree fruits, nuts and other products under preventive controls and animal, for human animals. That date has been pushed back to January 26th of 2018. And essentially it's done to align the compliance dates for farms that kind of conduct similar activities so that if you actually do fall under preventive control other than the produce safety rule, then the dates have been pushed back to, to align that. And that's a, that's a positive step so that folks are not jumping through a couple of different hoops in terms of compliance dates, but it's one target whether or not you're under produce safety or um, or the preventive control rules. Additional uh, compliance date extension includes for those facilities that qualify as secondary activities farms, except when the ownership is, is reversed. So currently farms that own a facility that are at least 51% owners are those facilities would be considered secondary farm. But if the situation is reversed, then extension for those facilities where uh, the facility owns either the farm or is jointly owned by another entity that owns both the facility and the farm, the extension for that is January 26, 2018. There are some specific um, requirements. The operation cannot be located on the same location as a primary production farm. 
and the operation has to be devoted to harvesting, packing, and holding of raw agricultural commodities, and the operation must be under a common ownership of the primary production farm that grows and harvests and, and raises the majority of the raw, raw agricultural products. So there are some specific requirements there, but if a facility meets those requirements, then there's some extension in terms of meeting uh, the, the requirements. And it's really there for FDA to consider potential future rulemakings to modify the definition of a farm in order to address some of the ownership issues that has been coming up uh, fairly consistently. So and the other important one uh, has come up around extending compliance dates for food contact sub substances under food safety, uh, foreign supply verification program. Those food contact substances that could be material used in manufacturing, packing, packaging, transporting, or holding food if the substance is not intended to have any technical effect on the food. So for for the agency, for the FDA, to determine how to best address some of the feasibility concerns for application of the foreign spot verification program, they pushed the earliest compliance date to May 28, 2019. So I'm giving out multiple dates here. I'm sure the audience can download right. the same documents, but um, you know, it's, it's one that's available, and they can certainly write down or go back to the recordings here. Uh, for milk producers, in an effort to align some of the compliance dates with current National Conference for inter Interstate Milk Shipment and Shipments, NCIMS, uh, compliance to current good manufacturing practices uh, for preventive controls has been sh and pushed out to September 17, 2018. And the, those facilities did have a different compliance date uh, under preventive controls rule, but now this aligns with the current NCIMS uh, deadlines. And lastly, uh, for produce safety, for farmers, uh, there's some clarification on agricultural water testing requirements and time frame that allows the farmer at their own, you know, at their own discretion to determine the number and um, of the samples that they take of the, of the water as long as it's 20 or more and where they take those samples. So it does leave it up to the farmers, to the growers, to determine what is the best time and place to take the sample as long as there's a certain minimum number of samples taken. And, <clears throat> and there is, that, that, that it, takes, it doesn't take at least, at the minimum of two years and no more than four years to comply with this test. And so it allows examples of approaches that farmers may consider when collecting water samples and how they relate that to uh, their produce safety assessment uh, from the farm level. So those are um, some of the extension of changes in terms of timeline and specific rules. Uh, there's more, but I thought some of the highlighted ones were the ones that are probably folks uh, are more interested in. No, absolutely. So it seems, you know, and again, I'm not going to make, try to simplify this because obviously there's quite a bit of details here, but mm -hmm. you know, I kept hearing more along to get things aligned as well as time right. for clarifications. Is that right? So is that sort of the trend yeah. on what, yeah, okay, interesting. Absolutely, Joe. I think the key is that FDA is realizing, recognizing that there is, you know, the rule that as it stands leaves an awful lot of interpretation of what applies to whom and, and the level of compliance. And I think they needed more time for people to determine, both, both from the industry side and the government, to what works best. And this is just gives them time and for companies to also align themselves to determine, do I, do I fall under produce safety rules or does the preventive controls rules more applies to me? And so the timelines, or sometimes when there is, you know, it kind of goes back and forth. Some companies fall under one, while the others uh, fall under produce safety, for instance, then it'll be hard to have multiple compliance states and some ambiguity in terms of what complies to whom. So this is really intended for that, to, to clear things up. Well, and I think that's always been the concern that I know certainly you all have talked about, you know, tagging the last few years with FISMO. So, yeah. so 
It's like a, that seems like a smart move, right? Um, can right. I can, can I just surmise this then as far as the guidance documents, right? So we're still um, expecting nine, nine more that, that when those come out might give them a bit more time to uh, get more further clarification on the subsequent um, guidance documents as well? Absolutely. I think those are going to yeah. have, they're going to dive a little deeper into different preventive controls and how, what options companies have to implement them. So there's a lot of clarification there. And I think what people will find that obviously those that currently do have a HACCP plan, uh, you know, they're quite a ways in and meeting some of that. Obviously there's some additional consideration they've got to take into account. And that's uh, the guidance document that goes uh, Quite, quite a bit deeper in that in that area. I think uh, obviously the you know we wish this document was available quite a bit earlier, giving <laughs> give companies time to really assess them. But so for those that will be under the rule by September 17, obviously hopefully they're quite a ways in already, and just give them a reference point, at least in terms of hazard analysis and what preventive controls that they, they need to implement. And so it's right. not a lot of time, but you know, a little bit of time for them to take yeah. action. A, a lot can be done in a few weeks, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Let, let me move on to um, sort of the, the next sort of topic that came up, and, and that, you know, ties in very nicely with what we were just talking about. Um, you know, not ready for compliance. What should you worry about? That's a strong word we're using this month um, about yeah. most if you're not ready. I think the key is you need to – be able to tell a good story at, about how well you understand the hazard analysis, risk-based preventive controls, and that you're working on uh, you prevent, implementing your food safety plan. Perhaps as part of the hazard analysis, you've identified certain risks that maybe you didn't before or you need to make changes. So maybe you're at that stage. So those are the uh, things that you need to really take into account and, and show that you have thought about it, you have taken into account what risk exists and how you're going to implement the uh, preventive controls to address them. Sometimes implementation part takes time and show a, showing a game plan, so to speak, that you do have a game in hand, that you do know what to do. It just might take time. The equipment changes, the validation, the supply chain part of it. It's not going to be an overnight or, or a few days. Sometimes these things take time, but as long as you're able to have a good story, as long as you're able to show to the FDA and prove that you do understand and do have a game plan to address them, I think that's really what you should uh, the most concerned about if you're not ready. Uh, and I think FDA ha expects everybody to be 100% compliant. Um, that's not what we're hearing and expecting. But they do want companies to be thinking about what they need to do to be compliant if September rolls around and they're not 100% there yet. What, what's left to do? What's the cost? What's the logistic challenges? And how are they going to implement that within a short near future? And those would and be, be how to, folks should really be concerned about. And, and be able to communicate that, right, if the, um, the inspector comes walking through the door. That makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. So the, I guess really then the next question, and, and this goes towards the, the guidance documents, I believe, um, probably expands a bit more. It's just, you know, what sort of resources is the FDA providing? Um, we've got compliance documents. We've got, you know, trainings. What else have we got? As you said, yeah, I think the documents, obviously the guidance that have been provided, and I think on September 19th at 11 a.m., they're going to have another webinar to further discuss the the guidance documents and, and the game plan for submission of the future chapters. And then I think uh, the FDA obviously training their inspectors for internally working with the state on produce safety uh, regulations and how that applies is, is kind of what they've been on track and the trajectory they've been on, and I think they're going to continue to remain that way. So not a lot of change there. Uh, obviously, we would have liked a lot of this, as I mentioned, to be in place already in terms of guidance, but 
Right. Short of that, I think they're on course to continue to provide internal and external education to get alignment on, on what, what the rules are and what applies to whom. Yep. So that would be, that that would makes, be uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and makes sense. And certainly um, consultants such as yourself that are in the trenches and having help from the, the consultants is always a good thing. So, so when, yeah, and we, we, we try to help. Yeah. <laughs> well, I could tell you just these Fiscal Fridays alone, I, I get a lot of great response. It certainly keeps safety chain in the know as well. Um, so, so just moving on as far as, um, and, and again, you sort of touched on this, but if you want to broaden the thoughts around what approach should you expect from the FDA? Yeah, this is a good question. I think it ties into the, to the, to the previous question that we talked about. And I think in the most part, they want to know Again, do you get it? Do you understand how to conduct a hazard analysis that's compliant with, with FISMA and preventive controls rules or produce safety rules that make sure that applies? And do you are able to communicate that? Do you have a plan in mind to make changes uh, as needed to your program you know, to be FISMA compliant? Do they understand? Uh, and I think I, we expect FDA to understand that initial ramp up and implementation is going to be slow. Uh, it's just some things just take a long time and they're going to be overnight as we discussed. And I think as long as you're able to show that, yes, we did a analysis, we do need to change certain parts of our process, but getting that equipment manufactured, validated, and in, installed and commercialized and, you know, ready to go, it's it's going to take time. So we currently have this game plan in mind to mitigate the risk until we're able to implement those things. So those are the message and the communique that FDA expects from the industry, and we expect them to understand that this takes time and you know, as long as they're able to work with the company. But this may not always be the case, and, but that's the – that's what – we expect them to understand, at least. Right. And, and I think this was brought up in our last session, too, as far as, um, you know, just because of the date there, right, September mm -hmm. um, 17th, it doesn't necessarily right. mean that there's going to be a whole whole round of uh, FDAs hit, hitting, do you know, hitting the doors, if you will, right? It's going to be right. based on right. the, more of that, exactly. the high-risk scenarios to begin with. So and that, make, that makes sense. So, you know, going back to, you talked about this a little bit, but, you know, when we said about what's sort of the worries, but, but again, you know, what are the sort of the biggest concerns um, that, that you're seeing? I think the, probably the biggest concern that we have and we hear the industry have as well is that some of the inspectors, some of the, and, and by no means are we trying to throw that at the end of the bus here, but the education and approach for certain inspectors may not be uh, fully up to speed. You know, they may not fully understand uh, the, the rule and there may be interpretation difference, differences that may result in some clashes and disagreements between the facility, the organization, and the FDA or, or that specific inspector. So I think those are Unfortunately, probably going to happen at the beginning more more than any other time, but uh, I think what the industry can do is to at least themselves be fully educated, fully understand what rule applies to them and what they need to do to be compliant. That's probably the best thing they can do, and, and then of course the FDA is working internally to educate the inspectors, but that takes time just as folks implementing the FISMA compliance food safety program will have some ramp of time. I think education of the inspectors will have some ramp of time and there will be interpretation differences and there are resources on both sides that can be referred to to, to reach an agreement. But obviously the companies want to make sure that they're not just guessing at, at the rule, that they fully understand and if they have questions, if they want to reach out to the FDA through a technical assistance network or external consultants, 
and whoever they think obviously they want to have the PCQI trained and, and given all the resources at their disposal, disposal to understand the uh, implication on their side. So, you know, our biggest worry is, is just some of the initial interaction between the inspectors because they've been doing this for a certain way for a long time and now we're asking them to somewhat change their view, approach, and interaction with the industry. So it's probably the biggest concern at this point. Oh, interesting. You know, and, and it sort of reminds me a little bit of the conversation we were having last month um, with FISMA Fridays, uh, if I could just sort of add on, on something here to get your thoughts on. Um, the, you know, the, the focus last month was on, you know, what does uh, being FISMA compliant really mean? And I thought what, what interesting phrase that came out of it, and then, you know, ties a little bit to this is, the, you know, the concept that FISMA compliance isn't a project, right? So we're all looking for right. that understanding everything and what programs and how to define the gaps and update the programs, but that, that one of the biggest concerns and ongoing challenges is that continuous maintenance once you have, you know, gotten your FISMA compliance in order, if you will. Um, do, do you hear that? We know, talk, you, I know you work with so many customers out there. You know, I know is, is really the focus trying to figure out the gaps right now, or is there sort of this also thought of, okay, how are we going to continue to prove and, and show what we're doing, right? Absolutely. No, I think, Joe, you're, you're absolutely correct. And I think it is a shift in mindset and, and paradigm or however you want to phrase it, but it, it is not a project. It's not, okay, we start here, we have the hazard analysis, and it's complete. It, it's dynamic. Hazards change. New hazards are identified. Uh, process changes, formulation changes, uh, risk assessments change and evolve over time, um, new risks are identified, uh, new food products and formulations, market trends, all of that impacts the risk analysis that, that's conducted. So it's not something you do once and you file it away, that it is a evolving and a very live document that you have to um, maintain. It is a difficult thing to do. It is difficult in that you have to remain diligent and have the dedicated employees and, and folks within the organization that are committed to maintaining this. And, um, and you know, I think that's going to be one of the other challenges, it's just that, is, is maintaining it up to date. Right. So, yeah. so we can't start – we can't start putting out, you know, I survived FISMA T-shirts quite yet, right? It's good. It's, it's, I, 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 I'm at, you know, I'm, I'm managing FISMA, exclamation point. So, no, absolutely. No, I, mm -hmm. well, absolutely not. But, yeah, it's, um, it is definitely a holistic, both in terms of, I think academia plays a major role here as well, in terms of mm -hmm. the science and, and the regulations and the industry's implementation, I think. It's a, it's a total team approach. <laughs> a convergence of all the different components. And, you know, and, and basically, Absolutely. again, sort of our, our last session, we, we you know, really enjoyed the, the input that we received from, you know, hundreds of folks in our audience that, you know, are, yes, they're, they're going through this, but they're delighted to see, you know, the, the, the bar, you know, being um, aligned and, and raised. So, no, oh, it's good. Right, right, right. It's, it's, it's a good thing. It's ultimately going to lead to a safer food. We wholly believe and expect that, and I think that nobody really argues that, is, is just how we're going to, as, as an industry, manage this. And it will be some ups and downs, and, but there are a lot of resources out there. And, and the key is just openness. And realizing that it's not a perfect situation, but you understand the high priority risk, and you go after after them and with sound science and advice from multiple resources, and you know, don't be shy to talk about it. I think the, when I talk to companies, I get more worried when people say we don't have any problems, we never had any issues, or we don't have mm -hmm. any positives. You know, you know, it's not a, it's not a sterile environment, and it's not. There are breakdowns, and uh, the key is to understand how it happens and how we can prevent it from happening again or minimizing the recurrence of it. And that's right. probably the biggest part. 
and, and certainly with everything um, being much more transparent as far as yep. challenges in the industry, um, they, you know, certainly help guide that conversation. Well, this sure. was excellent. I'm, I'm so delighted that um, I was able to steal part of your time here on a Saturday um, to start to get as quickly up to date so that we wouldn't stall a few more weeks um, with all the new changes that just got announced. I thought we'll wrap up just a few things here, um, as we always do with Bisma Fridays. Um, you know, again, would be remiss not to mention uh, the Atchison Group and uh, members like yourself that have been instrumental in the industry in helping uh, figure FISMA out and how specific um, within an organization to manage it. So I'm always going to plug the Atchison Group and uh, encourage um, folks to look on their website and contact them if they need assistance and guidance with FISMA. And of course, um, Safety Chain, uh, you know, our program management software, ensuring the maintenance and continuous improvement of your programs is our mantra in helping the industry better manage their food safety and quality programs. Something I just want to mention, and I think I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you might have known this, but we did um, expand our solution offerings. Um, Safety Chain actually uh, acquired a process manufacturing software um, company that's really specific in the processing arena. So we're real excited about those solution offerings to uh, extend the depth and breadth of food safety and quality solutions. And then, of course, um, FISMA Friday is coming up. Um, I believe this will still be the case. We always like to update our session topics on what's uh, most pertinent out there. But I know there was a lot of discussions around environmental control programs. Um, so we're going to be revisiting that, I believe, next month in September. And uh, October, we're going we're gonna to address, I think this will be a fun session in October, um, FISMA and the election year, right? We won't um, have too many too many battlegrounds on that one, but that should be a really good session. And, of course, additional resources. Anything you wanted to sort of round up this conversation with? Again, I really appreciate you taking the time today. No, absolutely. I think it's a, it was a good conversation. I appreciate the time, and we always enjoy uh, the, the discussions. I think certainly sometimes questions really – even challenge us to dig a little deeper and, and interpret, interpret the rules a little more uh, robust, robustly, so to speak. But we certainly look forward to having more discussion on this. I think as we begin to digest the contents of the guidance document, we'll put that out there both in terms of a written format and, and as part of the Facebook Friday discussions as well. So uh, certainly be on a lookout for that in the coming weeks and months as, uh, as folks kind of ramp up and implement their, well, at least on track to implement their food safety plan and, and that, all that goes with it. So I will just have that. Absolutely. And, and again, we'll put in um, a sort of, in, in, well, you've received this, the audience, because if you got this recording, you've received our follow-up email. But I'll go ahead and uh, we'll put a link in there uh, with what's been posted on, on the Atchison Group site so you can go there versus um, digging through the FDA. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate this. I do hope that those listening in um, have gleaned a bit more information. It was always informative, and we'll look forward to uh, hosting a live session in September. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jill. Have a great